On the show this week, what sounds better, vinyl, CD or MP3? John takes a long, hard look at Apple's new Mac Mini and Susie unpacks the US military's ultimate survival kit. What do you listen to your music on? This, this, or something like this. These days, it's pretty much a straight choice between vinyl, compact discs, and what are commonly known as MP3s. But which one sounds best? Well, we've invited the band Stereogram onto the show, and we'll be playing them their own music on all three formats to find out which one they prefer. It wasn't until 1948 that vinyl was born. Up until then, records were made from this, shellac. And it's hardly ideal. This 10-inch will only offer you about four minutes worth of listening. And worse still, the material is very brittle. Vinyl was a whole lot more flexible, cheaper to produce, and soon became synonymous with the popular new music of 50s rock and roll. 50 years on, and vinyl is still the material that every record is made of. So, how does a record work? Well, on the face of the record is a groove that spirals in towards the centre. As it moves along, it varies in depth and width, so that when a needle tracks the groove, it's caused to bounce around and vibrate at different rates. Those vibrations are sent along what is called the tone arm. Next up, it goes into the amplifier, and finally, it comes out the speaker, and we hear it, the sound. Vinyl ruled for many years, but the advent of digital music changed all that. In 1982, Philips and Sony produced something that they claimed gave much better sound quality and would never degrade. The compact disc was in fact launched with the slogan, perfect sound forever. What they really needed was an album that would prove irresistible to the new well-heeled class of the 80s, the yuppies. Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits was the first CD to be a huge success. CDs became, and still are, the most popular format for music sales. They work in a similar way to a vinyl record. Under a protective coating of plastic, there's a track, a raised ridge, that runs round the disc, printed on a thin layer of aluminium. When a CD is written, tiny pits are made in the track, and they make up the data stored on the disc. In a CD player, a laser runs along the track, reading those pits. The digital information stored on them is then decoded and turned into sound. Of course, we're in the middle of a digital music revolution, and the icon of the era is this, the iPod, from a family known, wrongly as it happens, as MP3 players. When it was invented, it was indeed called MP3 and was a way of compressing music to take up less than a tenth of the file space of a CD track. It uses a technique called lossy compression, which actually gets rid of all the sounds that we can't hear. Say, for example, a musical instrument is drowning out all the other tracks. It just ignores those tracks. It also chooses to ignore those sounds that are outside the range that the human ear can pick up. These days, not all of the music you'll download is actually an MP3 file. You might use WMA or Apple's AAC or indeed a myriad of other file types. But despite MP3s being much less used, the name seems to have stuck. With the influence of the net and the ability to store digitally compressed music files on your phone, your watch, even your sunglasses, the format has finally taken off. And for many people, it's now the only way to listen to music. But is the sound quality any good? Join us later when we play the band Stereogram their own music on vinyl, CD and MP3 to find out which one they think is best. This is Apple's latest desktop computer, the Mac Mini. It's only six and a half inches wide and costs just £339. It's supposed to compete with bargain basement PC systems and tempt people like me who've never considered buying a Mac. At this price, the idea is I won't be able to resist enjoying those legendary Mac benefits. Smooth styling, a more stable operating system and freedom from most viruses. But I'm not quite sure it's the bargain Mac we've all been waiting for. 
The first catch is what's going on inside this little thing. The standard Mac Mini is not a very well endowed computer, with just 256 megabytes of RAM and a relatively slow processor. I reckon you need the faster processor option and the RAM boosted to an optional 512 megabytes. The trouble is that's already raised the price of my Mac Mini to £449. And you'll notice it doesn't come with things like a monitor, a keyboard or even a mouse. The idea is you can use the old ones from your PC. But frankly, I don't want to use my old-fashioned tea-stained keyboard and mouse with my shiny new Apple. Rather goes against the point of buying into a designer brand. Not that on closer inspection, I can use them anyway. Neither my old keyboard or mouse have USB connectors, and even if they had, I wouldn't be particularly happy. I'd have used up my only two USB sockets. What you really want are Apple's own wireless keyboard and wireless mouse. 70 quid the pair, very chic, very stylish. One problem, though, the Mac Mini doesn't come as standard with wireless. It's a £35 option, so this little lot's cost us another 105 quid. Of course, I'd also like a trendy, thin monitor as well. And because Apple's cheapest screen costs £699, I've decided to shop elsewhere. Right, screens. I think it's down to these two. I heard good reports about Samsung's. I think we'll go with that. 170 quid. And I'd like some stylish speakers. We can get speakers for as little as a tenner, but uh, I don't think aesthetically they quite match the Mac. Ah! Hmm, these look just the thing. They're white, they're animalistic. Sold. 70 quid, though. So, my Mac Minis now cost me more than double its original price. But at least I can now plug everything in and try it out. It is all whisper quiet, and I don't mind the one-button mouse at all. The desktop graphics are extremely impressive, and I like pressing F9 to display all the open windows in miniature. I can also now enjoy some of the Mac Mini's software. The acclaimed iLife group of programmes comes as standard and includes a sound recording studio, GarageBand, iPhoto, a photo editing programme that's infinitely better than the grotty thing that comes with Windows XP, and a video editor, iMovie. I can import digital video for editing through the standard Firewire socket, and unlike the equivalent programme in Windows, I can output the finished results onto DVD. At least I could do if the Mac Mini came with a DVD writer. It doesn't. It's a £70 option. And even then, it only writes plus or minus R DVDs. It doesn't support rewritable discs or dual layer ones. So it's back to the shops to get myself a rewritable external DVD drive. I opted for a silver one made by Freecom, which set me back another 90 quid. And there's some extra software I'll need. The standard programmes won't cope with the sort of Word documents I exchange with the office or the Excel spreadsheets I swap with the accountant. Thankfully, Microsoft make a version of their office programmes for the Mac. And today, in the store, that'll be £369. Which means my economy Mac has now cost me getting on for 1300 quid. And of course, underneath it still has a rather slow processor. I think this is getting completely out of hand. At this point, it's as well to remember that the Mac Mini isn't the only small computer around. Compact computers, which look quite good, which don't make much noise, and which even come with their own displays, mice and keyboards, have been around a long time. They're called laptops. And these days, you can get an awful lot of laptop for 1,300 quid. Look at this, for 1,200 quid. Sony Veo, great looks, great specification. I'd far rather have that than a Mac Mini. Look over here for something that's better value. This Toshiba 699 does virtually everything the Sony does. And uh, on their website, it's only 599 And if you just want a cheap computer, there are loads to choose from. This JAL Constance, for example, costs £469, was much quicker at photo editing than the Mac Mini, and comes with a DVD burner, wireless keyboard and mouse, speakers and a monitor. The only thing it really lacks is a firewire socket. 
It's not as pretty as the Mac Mini, but I think it's much better value. There are certain gadgets that I just can't live without. My camera, I take it everywhere. And my mobile, it's an absolute lifeline. But there are some gadgets that people literally couldn't live without. I'm talking about the gadgets that save lives. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the Leatherman multi-tool. Very useful for fixing and repairing things wherever you are. But I bet you didn't know that they could be used to fix something as complicated as this, a helicopter, while it was flying. In 1997, a US Forest Service employee was in a helicopter when the pilot pointed out that the collective control linkage had disconnected near the rotors. As a result, the aircraft started an uncontrollable climb. The passenger climbed outside of the airborne helicopter and managed to reconnect the linkage using the leather awl on his Leatherman. He then stayed, hanging on for dear life, with the Leatherman held firmly in place until the chopper could land safely. So you've made the emergency landing, and the first thing on the agenda is to survive the wilderness. American Special Forces and fighter pilots use this the ultimate survival kit. It's fitted to the ejector seats of million dollar jets. As you'd imagine, this is not the novelty stuff you get in Christmas crackers. It's relied on by people who find themselves in the most hostile conditions on Earth. So, for a start, the case is practically indestructible. And it floats too. If you want to build a shelter, use the saber-tooth saw. It should make mincemeat out of even big logs. Let's find out. We could be here for some time. There you go. Obviously, you're going to need to light a fire, but if you're marooned out in the wastelands, that's not going to be easy. Unless you've got one of these. A blast match fire starter. The survival kit also comes with a special fire lighter that actually burns better when it's wet. The blast match is designed to be used with one hand in case you've sustained an injury during the crash landing. And the spring-loaded flint will produce sparks three times as hot as a normal match. And hey presto, no matter how wet the conditions are, you've got a fire. So you've got the fire and the shelter sorted. All you need to do now is get yourself found. You could try this jet scream whistle, which can make itself heard over most man-made noises, like the engines of a rescue helicopter, for example. Or you could use the star flash signalling mirror. Uh, you just hold it up to the sunlight, look through the star, and then reflect the light onto your rescuer. Of course, every military survival kit has got a signal mirror, but this one is different because it's lighter than glass and apparently it's indestructible. Uh, maybe not, but it doesn't matter how indestructible your mirror is. When the sun goes down, it's absolutely useless. However, there is a rather more sophisticated alternative. You could buy a £3,000 Breitling Emergency Mission watch Aimed primarily at pilots, inside this titanium case is a homing device designed to complement your aircraft's emergency transponder. Breitling have sold hundreds of these and they've been put to the test 17 times, all of them for a legitimate rescue. When you buy the watch, you have to sign a disclaimer to say that you won't use the transmitter unless it's a genuine emergency. So if you set it off in the pub to impress your mates, you'll have to foot the 50 grand bill for the seeking. This is how it would work. With the cap unscrewed and the antenna pulled out, the watch would send out a unique signal at the international distress frequency of 121.5 megahertz. Even in difficult terrain, this could be detected up to 10 miles away. And as all flight plans are logged in advance with air traffic controllers, you just have to sit tight and wait for your rescue.
Tonight, we're looking to see what produces the best music. Vinyl, CD, or MP3? Ask a sound engineer, and they'll tell you that if all things are equal, vinyl records should give you the best sound experience, because they reproduce music in an analogue form, which is most compatible with the way our ears work. They'll also tell you that MP3s will offer the worst sound experience, because they compress music electronically. Well, let's see if we agree. This is New Zealand band Stereogram, hot from this year's Grammy Awards. We brought them here to Tin Pan Alley Studios in London, home to everyone from the Stones to George Michael, so they could hear their music played back on the three different formats. If anyone knows how music should sound, it's the musicians who made it. So we're seeing if the guys from Stereogram can recognise whether they're listening to vinyl, CD or MP3. I'm going to be in that booth, OK, waving at you through the glass, and I'll only talk to you on TalkBack. The rest, guys, is up to you. Cool. Oh, Have fun. Thank you, All right. Fun. Cheers. To make it fair, the three different players we'll be using all cost around £220. For the test, we're using something the boys are very familiar with. Their single, Go. First up is a vinyl single played on this Newmark record deck fading up mid-track to avoid any telltale disc scratches. OK, gentlemen, uh, just to be clear, you have no knowledge of which format we're about to play you, but you will recognise the track. Uh, yes. OK, here we go. Track number one. Cue the music. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Mm. Well, well, I don't know. That was muffled, and the guitars, there was no real definition. We're going, um, we're going the MP3. I'm going for MP3 and iPod yeah. or something. All right. It's unanimous. Are they your final conclusions? Yeah. 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 Next, we use the iPod they thought they'd just heard. Although it actually plays MPEG-4 files, it uses the same sample rates as all MP3 players. Now, remember, the boys have no idea what they're about to hear. Once again, you'll recognise the track, but not the format. Who knows? <laughs> It sounded, it sounded really good, but I don't know if it sounded the best it could sound. I'd put my money on it either being a, you know, an LP or a CD, I don't know which one. Yeah, I don't know, I guess we, we have to hear the, the, the last, last one, one before mm. we can make a decision. Mm. But definitely a lot clearer than the, uh, the first track. Mm. That's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying I'm CD. 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 Yep. They may have seemed certain, but they were wrong. Time to test them with our final format, this Cambridge Audio CD player. OK, gentlemen, uh, have you got your listening gear ready? Yeah, all right. certainly do for me. You've seen these two big flappers on the side of my head, yeah? <laughs> I've got to compete with that, boys, all right? <laughs> OK, Steve, cue the music. We're not in agreement on this one. Yeah. I'll be honest. Yeah. I, don't, but, I don't know, that's a, that's a tricky one. I don't think um, they'd had a whole lot of compression on it, so I don't think, because there were parts that were a lot louder, parts that, you know, there weren't, there were a lot of valleys and lows. And uh, so, I don't know, I, I don't think it's MP3, but... I'm going vinyl, I don't know. Can Top I just say something, yeah? Yeah, man. You put your hand up before you spoke there. Yeah. OK, you're a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I might go with you with the vinyl, I think. Vinyl. So, after hearing all three formats, the guys failed to identify any of them correctly, believing the technically superior vinyl to be muffled, and judging the iPod to be a lot clearer, even though the music has been digitally compressed. So, where does all this leave us? Well, it's fair to say that if we'd been listening to a more complex, a more subtle sound, say, for example, an orchestra on a high-spec system, then the vinyl probably would have won. However, for those of you who like to listen to your rock on a portable music player, it's reassuring to know that what you get is pretty much what the band intended you to hear.
The world of computer gaming is evolving at a colossal pace. The graphics are now getting so realistic. On the water, it can reach about 50 miles per hour. Under the water, it can reach about 25 miles per hour.